so yeah, I'm Ed. I'm head of data science at Thread. Um, so just a little bit, first of all, about what uh, Thread is. Um, we're a, an online um, personal styling service. Uh, currently men only, I'm afraid. Um, you sign up uh, and you get a, assigned a stylist for free. Um, you receive uh, some recommendations uh, that we send out in, in emails at, uh, each week. Um, you can also browse um, our catalog, um, everything sort of personalized to you. Um, and you can read content that's personalized to you. And, and of course, you can uh, buy some clothes through our site if you want to. Um, we're a small startup currently, um, getting near, near five years old now. Um, but uh, we're, we're rapidly growing. So just to give you um, a little sort of tour of um, the, the thread site, uh, this is, once you've signed up, this is sort of your, your home feed where you receive all your kind of recommended um, content. So it might be, might be an outfit suggestion um, of what to wear. It might be particular items that we think would be re really great for you. Um, so, so your stylist um, will, will, will recommend you these, these uh, uh, selection of outfits each week. Um, as, as you can see, I, I, I take the suge suggestions very literally. Um, so this is not just a great weekend outfit, but a, a great outfit to wear to Pi Data. Um, <coughs> and, and I dress exactly how my stylist tells me to dress. <laughs> um, we also have an, an area of the site which is all about sort of personalized content for you. So it might be, you know, we think a particular sort of set of um, uh, shoes would be great for you. Um, or we make suggestions of, of how, you, how you might dress for different kind of occasions, that type of thing. And, and we also have more closer to a traditional e-commerce um, part of the site where you can just browse, freely browse um, all the items that we, we, we sell through the site. But it's, it's all sort of personalized and curated for you. Um, so you don't have thousands upon thousands of, of items to kind of trawl through. Um, and everything's ranked in, in a personalized way. So where does the data science machine learning come in? Um, well, we have about half a million clients to style. But we're a small startup, and we've got eight uh, stylists who work for us. So how can we sort of scale the work of eight uh, stylists to style half a million clients? Well, that's where the sort of um, machine learning algorithms, we it sort of interweave everywhere in the site. Um, so it's, it's a combination of, um, of, of, of algorithms with uh, stylist-generated content um, that, we, that we link together, which makes it a really interesting, interesting problem. So this is just a picture of Team Thread, at least as it existed. It's probably about a year ago now. So we're now a bit bigger than this, but um, just to give you sort of an idea of, of, of how, how many people we are. OK, so this talk uh, is going to be a talk of two parts. Um, the first part, I'm going to just talk about a really simple off-the-shelf technique, um, which, you, which I tried in sort of half an hour and worked incredibly well on, on part of our data. In the second part, I'm just going to talk about a very similar um, technique, which you might have expected to work well, um, but didn't, and talk a bit more about sort of lessons learned um, in, in the area of, of, of recommender engines. So, and, and my other reason for giving this first part of the talk on, on style components is, is I can just show some lots of pretty pictures. So, uh, a question of style. Now, uh, getting a user's style uh, and getting their sort of taste right um, ha has been one of the hardest things that we've faced at, at Thread. Um, and the reason for this is that the, it, the vocabulary of style is, is complicated. It doesn't really mean the same for any two individuals. So, for example, if I asked you, how would you describe your style? There are all sorts of words that you might use. Classic, preppy, casual, smart, or, oh no, street, hipster, cool, smart. But what, what do any of these words really mean? Um, and actually, when Thread started, I think we, before my time, but we, we, we did actually try to ask users how would they describe their style. And, our stylists um, found that, uh, that men just, just couldn't really tell us what their style was. And if they did tell us, uh, the stylist would look at the kind of um, items they were buying or wanted to buy 
and they just completely disagree with them. So they might say, no, I'm, I'm definitely not preppy. And then the stylist will say, yeah, you, you are, actually. <laughs> um, so it, it really doesn't work very well. And it was, it was very hard for um, our stylists to get a handle on what people meant. And so they couldn't recommend very, very, good, uh, very good outfits. So um, we qu quickly realized that it's much better to do this thing visually and just sort of ask users um, when they sign up to just, just pick some, some images that they, that they like um, of, of people dressed in various outfits, pick some images that, sort of, that they would quite like to wear, perhaps, or, or that they would like to sort of aspire to, to, to dress like. Um, but, of course, when you do this, you, you do need a lot, of, a lot of photos to kind of cover all the sort of nuances and tastes of, of, of different styles. So you end up with, with quite a lot of... Um, quite a lot, a lot of data to, to analyze about a, a given user. Um, and whilst having all this sort of detailed data of exactly sort of which kind of styles and, and outfits an individual user, whilst that is very useful for, for us to make good recommendations, um, we thought it would be nice to get, be able to get a bit of a kind of summary view um, of what a, a user's style, um, what a user's style is and, and what our sort of population of user's styles are. So, First, we need to kind of translate from this world of style and fashion, which obviously, as a data science, um, I, I find hard to understand, into something that uh, is a little easier for a data scientist to understand, which is a style vector, which is just a, a vector of ones and zeros, a sparse vector of ones and zeros. Now, that, this is getting a bit easier now, right? Um, so, and, yeah. And, and, and even better, um, <clears throat> now we look at the population of users and we look at all those vectors of, of ones and zeros that they've chosen and we, we have a, a SciPy sparse matrix, which, which is much, much better for a data scientist to understand. So um, we're in the world of sparse binary matrices and kind of a natural thing to try to do if you're a data scientist, you just want to see how this data looks is to see if we can do some dimensionality reduction in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this big matrix of our users and the style photos that they've chosen. So um, I just chose to use a standard off-the-shelf shelf technique. You can do this you know, in, in scikit-learn in, in 10, 15 minutes. Um, Non-negative matrix factorization. Um, why NMF? Um, well, I, I thought that First of all, we have positive data here. We have ones and zeros. But also, um, I didn't really want sort of negative styles coming out. So I, I didn't particularly. Would it be useful to say you're a negative hipster, for example? Well, yeah, may, maybe. Maybe it would, actually. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, yeah, so I chose this method, very simple off-the-shelf method. And it just works amazingly well here. Um, so what do we get out of this? Well, we, we get a, you can't see this, sorry. Yeah, we get, a, we get a style component matrix, which is sort of like the lower dimensional um, directions in style space, if you like, and we get a nice kind of, a, a small re reduced dimensional vector, which we could call user style profile. So what happens if we actually zoom in? Excuse my fancy slide transitions, I got a bit carried away here. What, let's, let's have a look at what comes out if we, if we look at this style component matrix in close up. And here's, here's what you get. So just sort of showing part of the matrix here. And don't worry, you can't see this too well yet, because I'll show in a bit more detail. But just, just showing um, sort of part of the matrix here, not all, not all the sort of components that, that we end up using. But um, what you see is it, it, it just really nicely separates out all of the suits in one component. It just says, OK, that's put, let's put all the suit guys together in one, in one component. We've got a much, much more kind of casual um, street sort of component. Um, we have a slightly kind of preppy uh, component there, and, and, and it just sort of came out just really nice, and, and um, I was quite amazed when I saw this, how, how easily this, this sort of decomposed into some nice kind of coherent um, components. Um, so what was nice about this is that, well, why, why do this in the first place? Well, um, it, it kind of provided a, a coherent sort of language that we could use internally um, to describe users, because remember, we're working here with sort of machine learning, but with humans in the loop. So we've got, we've got real stylist experts, and we've got data scientists working together. We want to be able to kind of talk about users in a coherent way. So this was sort of very useful for that. 
Um, and, and even areas of the company like marketing. Um, to be able to better understand the groups of our users, we can kind of use this as a, as a technique to kind of group users or cluster users according to, their, according to their style, which is really important when we use marketing, which is so heavily image-based. Um, um, we can look at the demographics associated with each, with each component. Again, something that marketing are really, really interested in. Um, who should they market to to maybe get um, users who have higher budgets, for example, um, and, and the age of the users associated with these things. And of course, we can use this inside, um, inside recommender engine as, as, as model features and so on, but that probably wasn't the primary purpose for us, for us trying this. So our stylists actually started labeling these kind of uh, <laughs> informally, slightly jokingly labeling these, these components. Um, so these ones, the city boys, which, are, which I'm quoting from our head stylist, Shawnee here, classic suits, business looks, mostly safe styling with a few roll necks worn under suits as the most daring. <laughs> and these users tend to be, not surprisingly, high budget users, and they're a slightly older user. Fairly, you know, fairly obvious, but it's kind of nice to be able to actually kind of quantify exactly what that means. Um, this this uh, <laughs> component, um, which our stylists call the dude next door, um, he's like a sort of basic casual user, and uh, he has simple separates that don't make a statement, no, not slim sitting, reliable menswear go-tos, e.g. polos. Um, and these users have very low budgets. Um, <laughs> they've almost sort of like maxed out their, their when we sign up, we, we ask them what their budgets are for different categories, and they've, sorry, sorry not maxed out, they've, they've minned out the budget sliders all the way to the left, these users. Um, and interesting, they're actually a slightly older um, user. Uh, this one called Tailored Smart Casual. Um, blazers with jeans and no fuss. And, the, and they have higher budgets and, and a slightly older user. And this one, which our stylist called Scandi and Slim. Scandi contemporary streamlined overcoats with crew necks and slim jeans. So, and they, had, they have actually um, low bud, fairly low budgets and, and a younger user. So yeah, it's been really kind of interesting just to look at this, a very, very simple technique that kind of works, works really well. Um, and it lets us get a nice, easily understandable kind of style, simple um, style profile, low dimensional style profile for our users. So for example, um, my style profile, profile here indicating that uh, at least when I signed up to Thread, I had no idea how to dress. Um, <laughs> obviously, I can't quite decide sort of where, where I sit, right? Hence why my stylist is, is helping me out. Um, <laughs> so just, you know, you can get a kind of like a nice sort of distribution over, over the different style components here. So these are just picking out a few examples. Um, um, w one thing is definitely clear that I was not going to be into biker jackets, <laughs> which is component number six here. Um, so, so yeah, um, uh, I wanted to show that as a nice sort of visual example of a sort of interesting collaboration between data science and um, human experts, something that, um, th as I said, was just taking a, a really, really simple off-the-shelf technique and just, just happened to work very well on this, on this data. Um, so on to part two. Um, a little bit different here. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned at Thread um, about uh, some aspects of building recommender, recommender engines. And um, the kind of link to the first part of the talk here is that, uh, well, one of the, obviously one of the main techniques in, in recommender engines is collaborative filtering. And um, uh, in particular, user item-based collaborative filtering, um, where uh, tried and trusted techniques are exactly the kind of matrix factorization that I showed you in the first half of the talk. Um, so um, lots of people use matrix factorization-based collaborative filtering to do recommender engines. Um, but for us, we did try this uh, along, uh, amongst many approaches. And for us, they really don't work um, very well at all. Um, so I, I kind of spent a bit of time kind of analyzing why, why that is. And I think it sort of boils down to a few, a few key points. Um, firstly, the sparsity of rating data per user and per item. Um, 
we do have a lot of new users. They haven't rated many things. Um, and also, we're constantly getting new stock all the time from, from, our, um, from our brands um, and, and third-party suppliers. So there's that constant churn and rotation, which means that the, the number of items sort of rated per user and, and, and number of rated per item is fairly low. Um, that definitely doesn't, doesn't help the, this type of method, at least, at least out of the box, off the shelf. Um, we do have already very rich metadata about both users and items, um, partly because we, when we ask people to sign up to the service, service, we do collect a lot of user data up front. So we perhaps have more user data than most standard recommender engine systems would have. Um, and also item data as well. For, the, for, for this whole system to work, we need a lot of um, tagged data associated with the items. Um, which, which we have available for the, the whole of the, the website to work, really. So it's sort of not extra for us to go, go away and collect that item um, metadata. It's already there. So those, those, th sorry. those things already are um, kind of biasing us towards a model which is much more of a content-based recommender rather than a collaborative filtering-based recommender. Um, the other thing is that if you actually analyze what happens, if you try a matrix factorization type approach on this data, user item rating data, um, it's pretty obvious what the kind of principal kind of components are picking up from the data. And there are two d main components which are pretty obvious and very easily captured by a couple of simple, feature, um, couple of simple features. So there's, there's the, the there's a component related to price. Um, it turns out that people like cheap things. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so there's a very dominant factor related to price, um, which, which comes out of, of a matrix factorization. But you can very simply hand engineer a, a, model, a very simple model feature that will, um, will, beat that, will easily sort of beat that. Um, the second kind of principal component it's, it's obviously correlated to as well is just is, is obviously the overall sort of the overall past rating history for a particular item. So a global, a global rating rather than a personalized one. And again, that's, that's something that's, that's sort of trivial to capture in a, in a more traditional um, model feature if you're using a more traditional type of uh, standard classifier or, or, or regressor. Um, so yeah, as I said, a, a more traditional sort of hybrid-based or content-based model can, can, can learn those with, with sort of a few simple features. Um, you do get more success by kind of aggregating data um, higher up a, uh, a hierarchy or focusing on sort of users who are rating items very sort of prolific, prolifically. So it's, it's not that we haven't had some success with, with collaborative filtering here, but it's, it's, it, it's, much, uh, it's much harder than than uh, in, the, in the first example I, I gave you, where it just sort of came out really nicely straight away. So um, I didn't really want to go into sort of too much detail on, on, on the ins and outs of the model. But basically, we, we are using a hybrid recommender uh, model, which is a, a classifier or, or regressor. It's trying to predict things like ratings um, or orders, sales, and it's using user features, um, user user features, item features, and user cross item features. And of course, um, this kind of model um, is, is nice because that it's, first of all, it's, it's very sort of simple to train in terms of just using kind of traditional content-based features based on any of the tags we have, the user data we have, et cetera. Um, and if you want to put in uh, features which are based on collaborative filtering, you, you can do that. You can put them in as as user cross item features, either by kind of pre-computing um, user, user embeddings and item embeddings first as part of a pipeline and then feeding them in as separate features. Or you can try and learn the whole system end to end. But I, I'm not convinced there's um, a huge advantage in, in, in doing that. Um, or at least I've not found that so far. There's one area of uh, model feature where we've, we've had quite uh, Quite a quite a bit of uh, success with, um, which are real time uh, user event based model features, and obviously this 
you can't use these everywhere. Um, they're only relevant for sort of a part of the site which is very reactive and where you're able for a given user to sort of uh, re, let's say, re-rank items quickly after the user is, is maybe um, making some activity on the site. So the type of thing I'm talking about, just sort of, you can see illustrated in the picture, is just, you know, if a user is clicking on an item, um, liking an item, um, maybe sort of clicking through onto an item page and clicking onto some similar items, all these kind of implicit feedback signals that you can get out of user event data of, of what users are actually doing on the site, maybe even scrolling behavior, um, what they're scrolling past, um, you can derive some quite powerful features that have a lot of predictive power over a short time scale. Um, so, you know, if someone is, is clicking on a lot of particular kind of jumpers, then it's, it's a, quite a good indication that they're sort of currently interested in that, in, in that particular category of item. That's, that's just one, one example. Um, but I wanted to talk briefly about the challenges of um, building a, a, a real-time um, training pipeline, because um, this is where, where things can get really tricky. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is very related to um, Stephen's talk that he gave um, a little earlier on. Um, he talked about some similar issues, especially when you're, when you're training models which have this sort of time-sensitive nature to them. So I've, I've faced this kind of problem in a few jobs that I've had. And um, amazingly, I, I, I think it's amazing that there isn't an, a sort of off-the-shelf solution for... For, for this type of, of training framework, feature training framework. Um, and we've always sort of had to end up, we've always ended up writing our own or, or in some form. Um, so this time, so at Thread, I, I wanted to try to do this sort of right from the start um, because I'd had some experience of this, these things going wrong in, in the past. And so I, I kind of gave a set of uh, a, a wish list for a real-time feature pipeline to, to our data engineer. Um, and we're working in a, in a small team, sort of just um, me, me and him. And, uh, and, and so I wanted to sort of present a little bit of, of kind of what was on my wish list um, and talk about why, why I think that they're important. So the first one uh, is something that, that Stephen mentioned in, in his talk, which is that... Uh, you should try to make sure that all significant logic um, which you're using in feature, in constructing features, so that may be things like data transforms, um, aggregates, that type of thing, um, should be on a shared code path between your live serving system online um, and your offline training. Um, I've seen um, cases where this has gone wrong subtly in the past, and it's, it's always very, very hard to diagnose um, where the problem is. And, and an example um, from a previous job was in, in ad tech um, was where we had uh, a model training, model trained, which was a, a Python separate model training uh, pipeline. And as part of that, we were taking a URL string and we were splitting the URL into the different sort of top level domain and sub, um, sub domains below. Um, and there were a bunch of sort of special cases with this sort of URL splitting. So it wasn't completely, uh, a completely simple, obvious kind of function. But, but in that tech stack, the online uh, model that the, the actually um, served, the, served the recommendations, because it was ad tech, it was very latency sensitive. So that was, re that was rewritten in, um, I think it was in Java. And, and so it was, that part was completely rewritten. The URL would come in live from the stream, and it would be split. But that was a Java function that was doing that splitting. And there were unit tests on, on both these functions separately, the same unit tests. But still, there was a very, very subtle difference in how the splitting worked. And when you have something which, um, when you have model features that are trained, you know, the coefficients are learnt and conditioned on something being, a feature being transformed in an precise way, you can get completely completely um, different results online, obviously, even with a small, subtle bug. And the only kind of way that you learn about that and can detect that is if you're actually tracking a live 
model performance metric, like if you're able to track live AUC from the actual live serve results, and so not test set AUC, but live AUC, and you notice that your live, a, live a model a, AUC of your classifier is way worse than your test set AUC that you've got out of your model training pipeline. When you see that, what, what do you do? It's, it, it's, it's very hard to sort of pin down wh where is that AUC difference coming from? Like, I, I thought we should have, should have had a, a, a 0.8 AUC, but what I'm actually seeing is 0.7. Like, why do I have that huge difference? And we spent ages trying to track down that one, and it turned out to be a tiny, tiny bug in a, in a, in a URL splitting, splitting function. So ever since then, I, I kind of had this, um, this, this, this idea that uh, it's really important to try to share code between online and offline. It, sometimes in latency-sensitive applications, it's hard to achieve that. But I think you should try and make every effort to achieve that if you can. Uh, <clears throat> Second uh, item on the wish list was it, it must be possible to painlessly <laughs> reconstruct the state of user feature data at arbitrary points back in time. Um, and this, this is where the, these kind of like time-sensitive time real-time features, this is particularly important in this, er in this area because, um, because of the, the old accidental peeking into the future problem and accidentally kind of using user events from the future uh, where you shouldn't be during, during training. Um, normally in machine learning, you know, maybe a few, uh, a few, you could perhaps get away with that sometimes without hurting you too much. But with the, these kind of real-time uh, features, it, it can really bite you um, if you get this wrong. Um, a, a relevant example in our case would be um, it turns out, suppose we're trying to predict the likelihood that someone will make a purchase of an item. And we're trying to use all, the, all of the user events up to the current state of time to make that prediction of whether they're likely to, predict, to, to buy an item. Um, it turns out that a lot of users um, will, uh, will, um, will like items. So they'll rate the items that they've bought. But they'll, but they'll like them after they've bought them. So they'll, they'll buy something, and, but then they'll think, oh, I probably should have rated that, and I'll, I'll give that a, a heart. So imagine you've got um, an accidental bug here where you're accidentally using the fact that a user has liked an item to predict whether they're going to buy it, and you're using the fact they've liked an item uh, for, from the future. And obviously, you're going to learn a, a really, really strong model coefficient. It's going to latch onto that, and it's going to love, it's going to love seeing that. Um, so it's that, type of, it's that type of problem that you have to be really careful to guard against. And to do that, if, you, if you're doing this kind of real-time feature training, you, you need to be able to go back and kind of replay history faithfully to what, what was the state of this user's, user's, user data um, you know, um, last week. So obviously, there's kind of an obvious way to do that is you've just got the sort of raw user event logs and you go back to the raw user event logs and you and you maybe kind of replay them up to a certain point in time. That's an easy way you can ensure that you can do that, but um, often that's going to be really slow to do that. Right? So it's, it's going back to sort of raw user events and sort of replaying them every time you want to do a, a new model training can be pretty painful. <clears throat> so uh, the third wish list is kind of necessary for a real-time uh, a feature pipeline because it needs to be real time. So you need to actually have the user data available for you for use um, to to make recommendations in real time. So it needs you need to be able to query for up to date user data. Um, and where where this is kind of non non obvious is if you are if if you're making sort of derived features, say little aggregates based on based on user event data, for example, a sort of a histogram over the categories of items that a user has been clicking on, something like that. Um, you probably want that stored in a form where you can easily kind of retrieve it in that, in that aggregated form, rather than just get receiving the raw, raw events. And the final one is that it should be easy to experiment with new features um, derived from these raw user events. Um, because there is kind of one obvious solution for the first one to, that sort of satisfies the first three on the wish list, um, which is that 
you have the, user, the raw user events. You have maybe these aggregates, which you're storing to serve online, which is some, something like, say, a, a, dist, a, a histogram over, the, over categories of items that the user has been clicking on. That could be one aggregate that you could store in a, in a compressed form to just pick up online. So one thing you could do is you could just, you could just sort of snapshot and, and cache the, a kind of a, a history of these aggregates as they change over time, over history. And during model training, you could go and look up Oh, what was this? What was this category distribution last week for this user? I could just go and retrieve that if I've been writing it out. But the problem with that is that it's that's fine for one particular feature that you've made and is working and is live in the model, and that that works fine. But what happens if you want to to, to change the the way that the um, change this aggregate in some way? You've sort of got to go and redo the the, the whole thing um, if you want to come up with a new feature based on the raw events. So it's quite surprisingly hard to sort of fulfill all of these things um, at, at once. And we, we had a look into this as a team, as I said, and we didn't find any kind of reasonable off-the-shelf solutions for this. So um, James Harlow, uh, who's pictured here, uh, he, uh, he's, he's our data engineer, and, and he went away and scratched his head and, and, and came up with a design that is actually, is actually working, working really well. Um, uh, that we just put together from various kind of components. So just describing this at, at, at a very high level, because I don't have too much time. Um, we've got a we've got a raw uh, JSON uh, events aggregator, which is which is Fluent D, and they get separated into two streams. One is we're just using we're using Amazon Kinesis for this because um, it, it's easier to use a managed service um, for the so the the online. The online path is sort of on the left in green, and the offline path for training is on the right in red. We're store just storing the raw events on S3, so that's sort of fairly standard. Um, but the first bit, the nice bit, I think, that achieves point one in the wish list, which is that you should share code everywhere you can, is that we've got, Spark, we've got a Spark streaming job that is constructing live real-time user aggregates, just very, these very simple things like window functions, um, histograms of user events per user. And, and that's doing this live in a streaming manner. And then we've got offline the same code, same Spark code working offline to construct the same aggregates from the raw event logs if we want to replay offline through, through the whole of history. So that's nice because that's got some shared code. Then we've got a live user feature data cache, which I sort of said you, know, you kind of want if you're latency sensitive. Um, we're just using Redis, but it could be any kind of key value store you could use for this. And uh, then we've got um, a historical user feature aggregates cached on S3 for a particular feature. So we've got this sort of like history of these aggregates um, for a particular feature kind of cached on S3 that we, should, we can just go and retrieve. And then finally, for serving, live serving, we have just shared Python code that constructs a feature from the user data live in the recommendation server online, but the same Python code, exact same Python code offline when we run model training is used to pull from these historical um, user feature aggregates on, on S3. Um, so it kind of pretty much achieves the wish list so, um, and is, is working quite nicely. So I just wanted to sort of show that at a high level. All right, I'm, I'm kind of out of time, I think, aren't I? Um, so I'll have to, it's a shame because I have to leave this one, the pants effect, for you to ask about. Two minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, this is just, <laughs> this is just a, a funny kind of little lesson learned from what can happen in, in with, with the, what can easily happen when you construct training data if you're not careful about little biases in the way you're collecting the data. So, um, what happens is if you if you build a little model that's say for example trying to predict the probability of a user ordering an item after they've seen it somewhere on the site. Uh, what you'll find is that pants have a very high order probability. Um, and, but th this doesn't really mean that you, you want to be necessarily recommending um, pants to the user all the time. And uh, where this, we, this was a sort of bug that we had to track down, or not really a bug, but a, a training set construction bias in the end. Um, and it kind of comes from the fact that we were just collecting um, training data from all across the site, and we weren't sort of caring too much about where it came from. If a user sees an item somewhere on the site, we count it as a training data point. But not all those points are equal because people operate in different modes on different parts of the site. When they're actually going and, and looking for underwear, 
they are not so picky about their pants, right? They, 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 they'll maybe view a few items, but, you know, if they're British, it's Marks and Spencer, they'd probably just buy it. Um, it's, it's a multi-pack, so, and users love multi-packs, so they'll probably just, just buy that. Um, so they're not nearly as picky. They don't scroll through endless amounts of items looking for it. So therefore, it, it, it ends up with a high order probability if you just sort of ignore that training set construction kind of bias in your data, the way you've collected your data. So we had to do some stuff to control for that, but I just thought it was kind of an amusing example. So, yeah. And, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, just, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, we're also looking to expand our team. So if you like this kind of area and like to work with me in detail then on this stuff, then come and chat to me afterwards. Any questions? Yeah. Hello. Um, thanks for that. That was really great. Could you comment a bit on the, uh, how the interaction between the stylists... Like, how, how do the stylists use your... So there's some sort of live recommendations that are on the site, but how, how yeah. does that interaction work between what they come up with and what you do? Yeah, the, the, um, the, the stylists are basically coming up with sort of candidates, if you like. They're, 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 curating, um, they're curating outfits, and they're, and, and they're curating sort of items that they really like for different kind of sets of users, That's it, that, that kind of thing. And then because, obviously... There's no way that a, a, an individual stylist can sort of send out recommendations manually to um, hundreds of thousands of users. Then that's sort of where the machine, machine learning model comes in and, and will rank, rank items. And obviously, when you browse the site live, then that's um, a machine learning model which is, which is ranking the items for, for you um, live. Um, so yeah, that's sort of roughly how it, how it fits together. Yes. Thank you. I've got a question about uh, how you measure the success of what you're doing. Like, people uh, order how, yeah. how, how you measure the success of your models. Mm, people order things, but they might, might return all the stuff that they ordered. So do you check orders? Do you check actual sales, like what they keep? Yeah. Um, we... We are sort of measuring a combination of performance metrics related to the models. Um, obviously, sort of whether we sell stuff is important for us, but that's not the primary kind of metric that we're trying to drive uh, drive up because um, we are we are sort of a, a, a styling and recommendation service. So the customer satisfaction with the recommendations that they're receiving is sort of the kind of primary metric that we're tracking. So we, do, we track that through various ways. So you can, on your home feed, you can, you can sort of rate, say, the outfit that we recommend as a whole. And we use that rating data as a sort of metric for the, the main kind of um, recommendations of how we're doing there. And also user, user surveys and direct kind of user feedback as well. Yeah. Um, do you have any plans to offer your service for women? Um, yes, we do intend to. Um, I just don't, I, I can't be any more specific on the timeline. Um, not immediately. Um, I think uh, we, are, we're like, we are expanding and um, we are likely to first sort of expand internationally before we do um, women's service. Um, but it def we definitely want to do it. It's just we're sort of too small to have the kind of resources to, to do that right now. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, how do you deal with the seasonality in tastes? I would imagine that people perhaps would be more interested in buying suits during winter times, but mm. before the uh, summer vacation, they may be more like preppy style. I, I don't know if this exists, and if so, how yeah. does the model cope with that? Yeah, um, we we do have some seasonal features which we learn in the model. Um, fairly simple things, um, um, but uh, it's 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 quite hard. It's an area where um, it's an area where that that's that's part of the sort of service which is more kind of curated by the stylist. So they'll 
they'll sort of say what type of outfit is appropriate for winter versus kind of summer when they're, when they're sort of putting together the, the outfits um, that, from, from the kind of candidate set that we use. Um, so it's not so much part of the model as being something which is sort of manually created. Yeah. Hey there. Uh, you mentioned the need to have a kind of time machine capability when you're training yeah. to, to stop uh, the model peaking into the future. Yeah. Um, and you said that that was uh, quite a painful thing to do. Um, do you actually do it, and how? Yeah. Yes. So, so that's kind of. If I just kind of go back to the slide. Um, so, so this this solution that we came up with here. When we do model training, we are kind of looking back by retrieving these historical user feature aggregates, that, that's where we've got this sort of time history where we do go back in time. When we construct training data, we're, we've got training labels, which, we're, which are a time series of training labels, and we're matching the, those up against aggregates. So we're, we're always um, calling, sort of calling in to that time machine and asking for, for any given, for any given training um, data uh, uh, instance, we're asking for what's the state of this particular user feature at this moment in time, what was it then? Um, that's what we do when we when we construct training data for um, features um, for offline training. Yeah. Okay. If there are no more questions, um, thank you very much. Thank you.